Mark Robinson, the Senior VP of Business and Legal. Larry Mustel, Primary Wave. Colleen Ice, the COO of The Orchard. Well, <clears throat> welcome to uh, another in our series of classes here on um, this semester we've chosen as a umbrella uh, powerful female executives in the music and entertainment industry. Phone's off. Good idea. Excuse me. <laughs> um, so we had, uh, in previous classes, we had Marshall Vlasic, agent extraordinaire. We had Kate Hyman, uh, who is an A&R executive at uh, BMG. And tonight I thought we would take a look at one of the more lucrative aspects of the entertainment industry, the live music business performance, if you will. Um, those of you who have paid attention in your classes know that now one of the major streams of revenue for an artist other than publishing uh, somewhat CD sales, uh, sync rights, uh, a main big deal, and it has an ancillary offshoot, the merch, is live music. Um, it's always been there. It's always been an important factor. It's always been a way for a band to develop a following, which is even more important today in, in a world where CD downloads, whatever, sales, are not as important in the scheme of things, but what you do at the box office certainly speaks volumes, A, into your bank account, but also helps generate a bigger audience and other opportunities uh, for you. So one, if not the most important women in the live music industry agreed to schlep down here tonight and be with us. Her name's Deborah Rathwell, and she is the senior VP of AEG. And if you don't know what AEG is, well, I'm sure you all, everyone knows what AEG is, right? Yes. Yeah? Yes. Yeah. So it's the, it's the second largest um, concert organization, music presentation organization uh, in North America or the world? Yeah, and, and uh, they have a lot of sports teams and they own a lot of uh, venues around the world, like the O2 in London, the Staples Center, Sprint Center in Kansas City. Um, Berlin, Hamburg, I mean, I can just keep naming cities, so built a lot of real estate and manage. We just joined up with SMG, so we'll be the largest uh, facility manager in the world, I mean, when, when that deal finalizes. But that's another part of the company. I don't really have anything to do with that, but it, it, um, it's, it's kind of an important part of, of who we are. I, I would say if you ever get a chance uh, to go to England, and you're in London, you got to see the O2. It is quite an experience. It really, it sets the standard. It's, it's the bar that everybody should be at. And the O2 wins Arena of the Year every year in the world. It was not built for sports. It was built for entertainment. It's booked probably 350 days a year. It, was, it sits in the home of what was the millennial, Millennium Dome right. um, that London built in 2000, this, this giant tensile structure, and we actually hydraulic lift in an arena inside this tent. It was just, a, it's just a, a feat. So it has all this space inside, and now this whole town has grown up around it, where it used to be just um, unused land. So uh, What I found fascinating was uh, the perimeters of it. There's all sorts of bars and restaurants and... Uh, you know, it's it's like uh, it's like New Jersey pack on steroids. I mean, at least or New Jersey pack trying to be even in that proximity. But it's a consummate entertainment destination, um, and they make it such that you could spend a lot of time there, and obviously a lot of pounds. But um, okay, so that's one thing. But um, I wanted to start with the uh, Deborah Rathwell story. Um, Deborah is. Uh, from Canada, she was in a, uh, came from very humble beginnings. I guess you were in a family, what, six? Six, um, you know, I shared a couple of things with Steve because I was trying to uh, demonstrate to young people that if I could actually be here and I could actually figure out how to get to New York, 
you guys can do anything. I grew up in a small, tiny village. There were maybe 300 people lived in this village. It was, it was like, a, like an Irish town set in, uh, in the English countryside in Quebec. And it was very separated by Catholics and Protestants. And I went to a one-room schoolhouse, and I walked a mile every day, and I walked home. You just can't make this stuff up. And um, you know, we ran wild. And uh, my dad worked for a power dam, which is why we were situated where we were. And he also uh, 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 bought uh, furs from the Indians that he took to the fur market. So you know, we we had this other culture that was always in our life. And um, one day we got bust out and went to a bigger school and then went to a larger high school. And um, I mean, it came from nothing. I mean, you know, when you have um, like an orange crate with a curtain on it to put your clothes in and um, we, my parents fed us, but we had books in our house. We were always told we were going to university and um, we were always well looked after. I mean, it was a great home, but had no money. So do you want me to keep going? Yeah, I, I, I also like the part of your history where um, I guess you first were uh, subject to peer pressure? Yes, so um, I remember we were so isolated where we lived and this would be in the kind of uh, middle 60s and um, so my sisters and I we get on this new bus because we're off to this new it's still a, an elementary school like you know what would be middle school here and um, you know we have these giant dresses on with crinolines. I don't even know if anybody even knows what that is anymore. But we show up and oh, whoops! Everybody's in mini skirts and it's completely changed. And it's like entering this other world. And I remember going home to my mother and going, "I'm not going back there. You've got to fix this," you know, because we were wearing hand-me-downs from my cousin. And so. I just determined that they were not going to do this to it. We had people ask if we were from the orphanage, because it was a very famous orphanage that sent kids to this school. And it was just from that point on, like you were either going to fight your way out of this stuff, or you were going to let this stuff beat you up, you know? And so I had to pick out who were the girls I was going to go there, and you know, like I just, everything. And finally, you know, ba did more babysitting, got money, you know, got stockings, got a mini skirt, you know, got a pair of white go, go boots that the dog chewed one. I thought I had lost my life and cried for three days, you know. Um, it, you know, we would, uh, you would have to clip out a coupon to order a, a, a single or an album and mail away for it and have it come. That's how remote we were that, that you could actually have music in your life, you know. But that's the early years. But do you think any of that prepared you for the doggy dog business that you had a Get it to yes. you chose, I mean, without yes. that background. Yes, you had to scrap your way all the time. And then uh, it was still scrappy in high school. It was always trying to, I had to always find who the popular girls were. That's where I was going. I wasn't getting left behind, you know, fighting through that. But you got to remember, it was always my parents, you were going to college. Because Can Canadian universities, believe it or not, I mean, I think my entire uh, college was like about $9,000. I mean, you, you, they believe Canadians are entitled to a college education and um, they're, they're largely subsidized and funded. You just have to kind of get your butt there. And, um, you know, they don't, people don't live on campus, you know, so they, they subsidize your courses. So it was, it was always within the realm of possibility. They weren't making up something that was impossible for you to do in Canada, so. So I always say, you know, the music industry is a grapevine business, it's about relationships, it's, you're sitting in the audience, you look to your left, you look to your right, you might know that person, maybe you don't, but down the road, you guys might uh, bump into each somewhere, each other, and all of a sudden you're doing the same thing. And I think perchance things happen, and particularly in the formative years in school, and, and you had that same thing happen to you back uh, in college. So college was, um, you, you don't live on campus in Canada. It's, it's a pretty rare thing. So you live in rooms and you watch schools. You know, it, I went to Ottawa. I went to, uh, to um, um, Concordia University. And, um, and um, by the way, what did you get your degree in? Um, I didn't graduate in the end, which nope. I'll tell you the story why I didn't graduate in the end. Okay. So um, I actually went to university about four years, but I changed majors, so that kind of threw me off. And then uh, one year I needed a room, 
And so, you know, on the bulletin board where they have little papers you tear off, but you're in social media now, so maybe they don't even have bulletin boards with little pieces of paper anymore. I mean, that was so weird. And uh, so I rented a room from this woman who was a singer and a poet, and um, she was just completely crazy, but I thought she was really interesting. So I ended up living in her house with her. And she had all these really interesting uh, musical people, and um, they played instruments, they were always going out and doing things, there was always people in the house. And I really started to like a lot of these people, and so kind of became friends with me. And then, and then, um, through this musical grapevine, they said the gentleman who owned the uh, record stores, the stereo stores, the radio station, the record company, and the concert company, his assistant was leaving after 13 years, and I thought, I'm going for that job. So I went and took an interview with him, and um, um, he liked me, and I, I know it was because here I was in Ottawa, Canada, going to university, and I read the New York Times every Sunday. It was just a thing with me, and I'm telling him this, and I knew I had it at that. That was that was, was that was that a big deal reading the New York Times. Yes, that was that was very expensive to buy the New York Times oh, oh, and oh. read it. And I, as a student, would do that. So um, I got this job. I was his executive assistant. I completely lied. I made up everything. He, he asked if I did it. I did it. I did none of it. So I show up, and um, I'm like sort of a ferret, you know, in the place trying to figure out how I'm going to accomplish some of these things. And, but I give great phone. I'm really out there. I have a lot of presence. You know, I'm, I'm not a shrinking violet. I've, I've really, like, I have to establish myself because I have to be really bold while I'm making up the things I don't know. And I remember uh, being called in to take a letter, and I said, tell you what. You tell me what you need to say. I'm just going to go write it for you, okay? You don't have to do that dictation thing, right? Because you, you couldn't do it anyway. I don't know what it was. I don't know how to do it. So off I went, wrote the letter, you know, and I just, everything was just finding some, like, other pathway to accomplish the goal without letting them know. I had no idea, you know? Like, I mean, I'm like... It, it, you know, putting carbon paper, I could doing all the wrong things. But anyways, I figured it out. I got it, you know. So. Ingenuity. Yeah, yeah. So there was nothing that was going to hold you back. Whatever you had to do, and if, if it involved telling some little. I'll tell you, I'll tell you one other thing. When I came and I did that, I, I really was setting this job to go somewhere. I wasn't just taking a job. I had made up my mind that this was going to be something and turn into something. And I was kind of thinking about this today that I never buddied up to, like there were lots of women that worked in the place. I never buddied up to anybody. I really stayed in my own zone. I was, I was friendly, but I wasn't about making friends to be part of like the girl pool or anything. And I, I discovered later on they had this really nasty name for me and I thought, oh, all right. And you know what that was? That was because I was going there and they were going there, you know? And I think nobody likes anybody to cut away because that's a lot of attitude and, and a lot of moving on and stuff. And I think if I hadn't done that, I don't know, you know? So there was another opportunity in the company for growth? You and that so I, the, the, one of the gentlemen I worked with, I mean, the, the chairman of the company didn't have enough work, so I started working for other people just to occupy my time, and so he, was the, he ran the uh, concert division there. And um, so I studied everything he did, I hung out in his office, I came in an hour earlier, I went late, I answered his phone. I was like pretty much doing his work at some point, and I could see he was getting a little bit you know, worried about it. But remember, no woman had ever been a concert manager, ever, ever, ever. Ever. And, you know, so. So what's a concert manager? Um, well, we had Donald K. Donald in Montreal was a partner. There was another company, and Michael Cole in Toronto was a partner. So we were kind of partners with them. But managing a concert meant you accepted the booking. Um, you had to agree to the financial terms of it. And then you had to be able to live up to your responsibility locally on all the things that we expected of you, you know, from the selling of the tickets, the managing the box office, um, uh, you know, the building, the rental, everything that had to happen locally from catering to the stagehands to production to the piano tuner to whatever went into, you know, doing a show. So that and was... And so he would do that. I would watch that. That's what I wanted to do. I wanted to be that person. So... His dad got sick. He had to go back to Buffalo. 
And I went in and asked, you know, my boss in, in Ottawa and Donald Kay in Montreal, Michael Cole, if I could be the concert manager. So they had to have this huge meeting on whether a girl could be a concert manager. And they said I could. And that's how I got started. And you were probably the first and only person in Canada. Uh, there weren't any woman. other women doing that at that time. So So you broke the glass. Ceiling. Maybe they were progressive in Canada, so they probably you know, yeah. yeah. So you did that and then uh, I guess opportunity knocked. So Donald used to call and say, Come work for me and I'd say, make it better, you know. Not, <laughs> not the Donald we know. No, no, this is he's a concert promoter in Montreal. He was, you know, a great empresario in the in the old days. And um and so finally he called me up and he said, uh, hey, baby, I'll give you a vice, you could be vice president, you know? So I got this title, I got the money, I got a car. And it, you know, I think today it was not that very much money, but to me it was a fortune. And um, so that's when I moved and went to go work for him. I was not leaving the job I had to go and, and take this kind of lateral move. It had to be something that led to something else, so. So, you know, in the Me Too generation, I guess I have to ask this question, but along the way then, was there any uh, situations that were uncomfortable or awkward uh, in the office or along the way to that career at that point? So, you know, we're talking about Joe Biden today and how friendly he is. Well, right. that was my old boss, but it was like always friendly, but just friendly, friendly. But I was always that guy. And... Um, you know, he would call, always come in my office and he would stand behind my desk. So I finally, I got construction, yellow construction tape, and I put it all over my office. And I said, don't go there, okay? It's not allowed. You there, me, no. So you have to set these boundaries for him. And know? he was but okay with that? He was okay with that. I thought it was the funniest thing ever. <laughs> so, but he would stop coming behind my desk and, ugh, driving me crazy. But so. it wasn't in a harassing way. He was just, no. he was just overly trying to supervise. Biden. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so you're working for Donald K. Donald, who's the big concert promoter, one of the big ones up in Canada. So I'm 27. 27 years old. Uh huh. And um, you and know, it's there wasn't anyone there that was so happy that the you know the new female vice president who was going to come and work with him. And so he actually, I had to sit in his office for six months, sit at the desk beside him while he would say things like, who are you on the phone with? Who are you on the phone with? Put them on hold, put them on hold, put them on hold. What are we doing? What are we doing? What are you buying? How much? How much? Whoa, what's going on over there? So I do this for about six months and I'm completely chafing the entire time that this is just dreadful that I have to do this. But I will tell you that that six months was the greatest six months that anybody ever gave me in my life. Because when camp. I, yeah. When I, when he said, okay, now you can grab your own office. Goodbye. Um, I knew what I was doing, you know, and, um, and then it was pretty much, um, he wanted somebody to come and run things, you know, so free up some time and take some pressure off. And I was happy to do that because that's what I wanted to do. And, um, but it was very much learning how to do deals then. And, um, People do deals today and they, they whoop them up in their computer. And um, I'm not sure they understand the math on what they're doing, although probably in a, in a rudimentary way. But I mean, I used to have to sit there with a yellow pad or we made our own forms and you took a pen and you added it up and you calculated the promoter profit. And you know, if somebody changed the deal, you had to, you had to really understand your math on what you were doing and putting these deals together. And, um, you know, then you would have to telephone it into an agent. You'd have to call it in, you know, item by item. This, was, this took a lot of time. This is why agents got paid, because they would have to sit and towels 100, stage 4,000. You know, we'd have to do these things. And then finally you'd telex it, and it would, it would be official. Telex. So, yep, yep. And, um, you know, eventually everything moved on, but that was kind of, you know, but I think learning in the simplest form sometimes makes you really appreciate. I can look at a spreadsheet today. I can tell you if it's right when you just put it in front of me. I can tell you if something's wrong with it. I can tell you if there's a mistake in it or it's not generating enough revenue. I mean, it's just, you know, years and years of doing this. So. Yes, people who work with you are very privileged because they learn stuff. Yeah.
So what was going on south of the border while you're working up there? Because the Canadian music scene is, didn't seem, at least to me, as fragmented as it was south of the border where there was all these little fiefdoms. Well, remember that concert promoting was very geographic. I mean, right. um, everybody had a territory, and it existed that way because um, agents in, in New York and L.A. and be it London couldn't see into your market. They didn't know what was going on. I mean, social media now, you just, Montreal, what's on? You know, I can tell you everything. You, they had no clue. And um, they needed you. You really were their eyes and ears. They would call you and say, is this going to work? I mean, we need this money. You know, this is how much it's going to cost. Can we sell this many tickets? So they would call the series of 30 promoters that were in America and, and ask if this is going to work and get their offers from them. So there was, there was you know, a guy in Philly, a guy in Boston, a guy in Buffalo, a guy in Houston, a guy in Dallas. That's right. And uh, forgive me if I have this wrong, but I believe Frank Barcelona That's right. at Premier Talent was one of the guys who kind of set up a network. And when a band wanted to come and tour, he knew how to plug in these guys and make sense of the things. He did that to try and give some kind of organization to a chaotic business. He would say kind of, you stay out of there, you go over here, like just, you're just bidding things up and you're creating this problem. Like, let's just get some form to it. And um, I don't think it was really antitrust or anything. I mean, no. they, people kind of knew what they wanted, but he said, look, I'm gonna be respectful to everybody. Everybody gets something, but just be respectful of each other. And uh, and that sort of began the, the I guess the network of concert, yeah. of concert promoters. Now that in Canada, that wasn't. It. We, it wasn't we had a, we took the country. We had Canada. Right. Okay. Right. Well, you know what? It's really ten ten markets, and um, it's a large territory. It's a different currency. It has withholding taxes. There's a lot of things when you cross the border and go there. Um, you know, you got immigration. You know, so. People find it scary, so we took the whole country. So and, and, and people liked to tour from one end to the other. It was just easier with your record company to make one sweep, Vancouver to Toronto or down to Halifax, and you were done. Or a lot of the American <coughs> tour, they'd go, okay, we're doing Toronto, Montreal, Vancouver, we're done. Now Which, they do. Yeah, yeah. so. Because nobody, after 20 or 30 days, they're so exhausted they have to get home. So, so. that network of people in different markets. So <clears throat> that lasted for many years until, um, you know, Bob Sillerman came along. It, it and Bob Sillerman, by the way, is an entrepreneur, finance guy. He's the one who took all the radio stations in North America, or mostly in the United States, and he got the cream of the cream and consolidated them, bought them all the little companies up that had, you know, that were available and created a, mom, a mammoth uh, broadcast operation at the time called Clear Channel, which today, those of you who follow stuff like that, that's known as iHeart. And I believe what he tr did or tried to do, or succeeded in a, in a way, was did the same thing with the network that Frank Barcelona had, is take all these concert promoters and say, look, you know, you guys are all working together, but United we stand, so we can create this gigantic organization, uh, which today um, is known as Live Nation. And a lot of people resisted it, and a lot of people hopped right on, and then some people said, I'm not going to do it, and eventually saw they had to do it um, to uh, be successful. So you had this mammoth organization, Live Nation, which had the ability to go to almost any manager or artist and say, look, we can provide coverage in all the United States, do this great tour, but you gotta do business with us. Until someone else came along, and I think provided, because competition is always needed. So just to go up, just before, before uh, they rolled up all the concert promoters to PM Live Nation, one of the things that started to fray at, the, at the, um, the set system that was in place was that Michael Cole started Right. doing tours. He, he took Rolling Stones away from Bill Graham and he created an even larger Rolling Stone tour than had ever been seen before by the way, on Michael's Planet a Earth. By the way, Michael's a Canadian. 
And then he, then he had U2, which he, he pretty much took away from Frank Barcelona, Premier, and, and toured U2, and, um, and then Pink Floyd. So you had this fraying of a system with somebody, and they took David Bowie, and I work for these people, so I, that's how I know all this. And I know that this pressure on the, on the system that had been in place probably for the last 10 years or 15 years was, was fraying at the seams because these were the big shows that, that promoters relied upon and you needed enough arena dates to make your balance sheet work. Then, uh, th I'm sure that's what Silliman saw was this thing that if I, I should roll this up and, and you know, have it all. And so, you had these, you know, a lot of the promoters had relationships with these managers that they had two or three baby acts as well as a headliner, and they would build up the local interest for one of their baby acts until it reached a level with the understanding that I'm helping you with this, but make sure I get the payday when you're, you know, your headliner tour. You could never say no to an agent for what you just said, that if you weren't doing all their crappy stuff and some good stuff, you know, you weren't getting the big stuff. So you figured out a way to do it. You figured out a way to either live through the crappy stuff and, and you know, make the most of the, good, the other good stuff they were giving you. I refer back to, somebody just reminded me, back in the mid 60s, there was a famous New York disc jockey named Murray the K and he had rock shows. He would make the artist do six to eight shows a day uh, at the Brooklyn Fox Theater or the RKO 59th Street Theater. And to get the headliners, he had to play that game. So the two bands that he was forced to take, and no one had ever heard of them, were The Who and The Cream. And they had to do three songs. And I can tell you, when The Cream came out, everybody was like, where's the rest of the band? There's only three guys here. And when The Who came on stage and, and Townsend's destroying his guitar, people are looking and going, meanwhile, the headliners uh, was, uh, I believe at the time, Mitch Ryder and Wilson Pickett. And, but to get what he wanted and to get this radio thing, so back then it was even more overt. If you wanted X, you're going to have to take Y. And he was forced to take those two acts that no one ever heard of. And... Um, Obviously, you guys know the history of where those bands uh, wound up uh, in, in retrospect. But the, so. Those were the days when the agents sat in the driver's seat. They controlled everything. I mean, you know, they were pretty powerful. You, if they didn't like you, you needed them to like you. I mean, it just wasn't optional, you know, and, um, and you worked really hard for them. And again, as I said earlier, it's a relationship business. Mm -hmm. You know, I always tell people I work with, you know, you meet people on the way up, you can meet on the way down. So be nice to everybody because you just never know. You just never know. Here was a young woman, 27 years old, and she's running the company. But, you know, six months, a year or two before, she was answering the phone and, and learning how to fake dictation. So, I, you know, I say be nice to everybody. Be careful who you piss off because you never know. And, and the agents are still like that. I mean, they're... It's all about relationships. They don't like you or you said something, they may not take your phone call. And then you're kind of locked out. And you can't afford that, particularly in the business like that. It's a supply and demand. So let's see where we left off is um, you're, you're up north working for Donald K. Donald. And you're, the I guess, the vice president at that time? The whole time. At that time, yep. okay. So... How do you get from Canada to the metropolitan area? So in the 1980s, we, um, we, we had the show at Place des Arts called Tango Argentino. And it, it was um, this wacky dance company from Argentina where older Argentinians danced the tango. And it, everybody went gaga over it. It was the greatest thing ever. So. You know, Donald said to me, because they wanted to know, did we want to do it um, in New York for a week at the Mark Hellinger Theater? And, um, you know, he said, is it, is it any good? And I said, yeah, it's really good. So we should do it. So we went and we figured we had enough money we could risk it. So we had a partner down there. And we put this show on sale in New York. And uh, it completely sells out. And the New York Times, it's uh, run, don't walk. You must see Tango Argentina. I mean, it was the funniest thing ever. So. 
We put it on Broadway. It sells out everything on Broadway. It then goes on tour, and this thing generates, I don't know, half a million dollars a week. It just, it's like this cash cow. Money just keeps coming out of it. So, and all it is is unknowns dancing? Uh, older Argentinian dancers dancing tango. It's the story of the, the tango done by two uh, French directors from Argentina. And um, all right, so I get an apartment in New York because I better be there. And um, um, which I had for about six years in, in the 80s down there. And then we actually did two other Broadway shows after that. So we made a lot of money on that. And I spent a lot of time in New York. I had my apartment there. And uh, becoming a New Yorker. Becoming a New Yorker. And so um, I eventually moved back to kind of going back into the pop and rock thing because theater is a really scary place to be. I mean, like, you can be riding high one day and then you are just a bum the next. Like you just can't find a win. Every, you know, if you find one rent or one phantom, that might be it. Like I'm not sure you ever get to do two or three of these. It's a very rare person that does. So I you know, had my daughter, I needed to feed her. I thought, I'm going back to pop and rock. I know how to do it, I can do it in my sleep. I, I need to guard against my future. So I went back to doing music again. <laughs> And then this was the time when uh, Donald sold his company to Michael, and I was going to go to work for Michael Cole. I was moving to Toronto, and then he said, you should go to New York. And um, so I said, that's a great idea. And uh, so I arranged to go and work for John Sher at Metropolitan Entertainment in Montclair, New Jersey. And, um, you know, everything went in a moving van and off I went. I left the country and, you know, a job and moved to New York. And, um, and then I, I worked at Metropolitan for nine years. But that was nine years and I kept thinking, somebody will come and let me work in Manhattan. I mean, like, just something in my life will happen. So Metropolitan... Um, uh, John had, had uh, partners and owners and they wanted to sell it and he kept stalling it out. And so finally I, I ran Metropolitan for a year with, with one other person while they tried to figure out what, how they were going to sell it. And then finally they sold it to Mitch Slater. So I had a, a, another owner for one year. And then he sold it and then they got rid of everybody. And I was supposed to go work for what is now Live Nation. And so I went to the office at Live Nation and I sat with two gentlemen who had their, their feet on their desk and all they wanted to do was laugh about, ha, 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 poor John Chair, right? And I'm like, this is so rude. This is just so beyond rude, you know? And I walked out of there and I called um, Randy Phillips who was at AEG in LA and I said, do you want to open a New York office? And he said, sure. And so... I called all the people that had been terminated. I mean, I think there were eight people I took back. And I said, don't tell anyone. We're opening in January. And um, it took me just a couple of months. We got space down in Hudson Street. And um, I pulled them back together again, and I opened up. And you So know, you were the first employee of AEG New York? Yeah. Yeah, I opened the office. So what was AEG before then? So AEG was only a couple of years old at that time. Right. And it started when uh, uh, Mr. Anschutz, Phil Anschutz, bought a hockey team in Denver that he wanted to move to Los Angeles, which became the Kings. And so he built an arena in downtown LA to put his new hockey team in. And then he put the LA Lakers into his new building. And while he was doing that, he, um, he, he, wanted concerts in his building and all of a sudden he had these people show up from this company called Live Nation who were telling him all the things that he was going to give them to bring shows and he said I don't like this I'll get my own people so he hired um, John Meglin and Paul Gonga were from Concerts West to act as concert company and Randy Phillips came on board we were building it was it was it was brand new so I when I opened in 2003 I think they were only a couple of years before that you know, kind of doing tours and stuff. And, and he still owns, he's the sole proprietor of the company? He still is, yeah. Yeah. So you glossed over something, and I know some of the women in the uh, class might want to know a little bit more if it's not prying too much into your personal life, but you said you needed to um, make sure you could feed your daughter. So at what point did you have a, a personal life in the middle of all this uh, work? 
And how does that, how, how do you juggle that? Because that's got to be an interesting dynamic. Um, so I was married to a lawyer when I was in Montreal who now lives in Europe. And I had a daughter who, when I moved to New York, was seven years old. So you can see... She moved with you. She moved with me. And so, so you're a single mom just in the New York. Us. Yes. And you've never, been to, you've never lived in New York before. Well, I had my apartment, remember? Right. That's it. <laughs> in the 80s. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but that was okay. That, that stuff doesn't bother me, you know. But... I have to, it was a little complicated because this job takes like 10 hours a day or 11 hours a day. So no, it's, it's 24-7. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I, didn't, so. I didn't sleep very much for a lot of years. So. Wow. Yeah. But um, it was before that, you know, when I was single in Montreal, that I decided to go back to Pop and Rock. And that's what led me to Metropolitan, not the theater. I kind of gave that all up, though it's a lot of fun, but had to move on. Wow. Well, having, talk about having it all. So, okay, so uh, you open up the AEG office in New York with some renegades from your former yep. place. And that doesn't sit well probably with the competition. Well, what was interesting was, it was uh, Dennis Arfa at AGI and Howard Rose agency, Howard Rose, who um, were so incensed that I had I had some Billy and Elton shows that they were doing together that I lost because I was no longer at this company that got sold to Live Nation, and and they didn't really like sort of the you know ha 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 of it from from the people at Live Nation. So they called me and said, "We'll give you your first show." All right. So I opened up with Billy and Elton when I opened my that, new that office. That was the one where they were together. Yes. Yes. So th that was, I was trying to think of the, the nicest thing Dennis Orff ever did that might be it, so, ever. So, um, and then it was a scramble, like we had nothing. I mean, this wasn't like buying a concert company where, you know, they do 100 shows, we had nothing. It was like on the phones. And uh, what had, what had kind of saved us was I had started, um, I did the American Idol tour the year before, and that was uh, that was a situation. And this is where you have to pay attention because um, you'll get pitched things, and uh, listen to everybody's pitch. I learned that a long, long time ago. You never know who's on the phone, and you never know what they're selling. And hear them out, okay? And I had uh, agent at uh, CAA, that was Jeff Frasco, call me and he said, we've got this show, it's called uh, Pop Idol in the UK, it's gonna be American Idol over here, do you think you'd do it, do you think we could tour the people? And I said, send me the stuff. So this is you know, when you get the uh, DVDs or whatever he sent me and I spent an afternoon watching it and I thought, it sounds pretty funny. I mean, I thought nobody had ever seen anything like this before, so I called him up and I said, sure, we'll do some dates. Unbeknownst to myself, everybody in America had turned him down. Everybody. I was the last phone call. I, I didn't even know him, okay? And, and he was an agent. But we had never, our paths had never crossed. So I had done a tour I, um, on American Idol. I tried a couple of, put some test markets up. Um, I couldn't tell if it was going to be a big hit or not. I picked two stupid markets, which is one of the first things you learn in, in now, learning the hard way sometimes, you know, like Phoenix and Tampa. What could you learn in Phoenix and Tampa? Nothing. They sat in the middle. They didn't suck and they weren't great, right? I thought maybe that's what I learned in, in Tampa and Phoenix. So we went on. So it was very successful. I mean, the first tour, it was, I think, sort of pre-social media. Like you couldn't see these American Idol people. You, people watched television. You hadn't all cut your cable yet, you know? And um, was it 22 or 25 million households? Yeah. Everybody knew who everybody was. Radio talked about it. So, you know, I had, I toured the Kelly and Clay. I toured um, all of them. And it was one of the things when we opened this office. And then I, I. They were successful. Yeah, they were very successful. They made a lot of money. They, they, were, they enabled me to, uh, to um, pay for the office, pay for the staff, while we were getting going and, and buying more shows and, um, and did, did establishing it, ourselves. Did anyone call you up and say, good job, thank you? Um, yeah, go get more. It's like you, nothing, it's never enough, you know. But what, from that, I sort of became the person who understood um, uh, TV to live, 
more than anyone else in America. So I did Dancing with the Stars, America's Got Talent, um, name them. I mean, uh, So You Think You Can Dance, I did for about six years. And I mean, finally they all kind of fizzled and went away and that was the end of that. But um, it, it really enabled me to pay some bills and um, it was easy work to do that, so. So you became the go-to person. And did, did <clears throat> so, okay, you took the chance and the risk there, not knowing that you were the last quarter of last resort. Did the agent, excuse me, the agent Jeff, did he come back to you and say, hey, you did this, I wanna. Well, you know, I found Carrie Underwood who was, I think, in season four, and Carrie Underwood has been my client for 12 years, and we're going out on, a, on another tour this year. I have 55 shows, and... So you would not have had her? I would not never have had, and nor have they had this sort of deep personal relationship with her and her manager, you know, um, if that hadn't happened and we hadn't had that experience together. And they appreciate you know? that and yeah. still respect that. Yeah, yeah. Says the adage in this industry, if you're looking for loyalty, get a dog. Yeah. But in this case, people remembered. Yeah. But what about the agent? Did he come back to you with anything he's, of interest? He's, I, he's probably one of my, oh, he's, there are days, you know, you can't abide him, but he's probably one of my best friends as an agent, and probably because I took the, I took the risk on that the first time, and I did it, and, um, you know, from this same agent, I also have done a lot of um, stuff with Disney. I mean, uh, you know, I told Jeff, Disney is Jeff's client, and I said, tell them we're going to do High School Musical because it's a phenomenon. I got to put this thing on stage. So he would call them. So we were kind of able to ying and yang it a little bit. And um, so we got High School Musical, the concert out, which was very successful. I got uh, Hannah Montana which was just a phenomena when it went out. And uh, I did Hannah Miley and took it to UK and toured it. I did 87 Cheetah Girl dates. I did a lot of stuff that paid bills that was really good stuff. And I like kid stuff. I don't know why, I just do. And, and I'll tell you, I have this, this woman today. I, can I go right to the future? Like yeah, right of now? course, of course you can. So, um, so Jojo Siwa, anybody who has little kids, Okay, right? Uh, her audience is like 4 to 11, all right? And she, at the time, I, I had one of the people in my office call and say, I had to go get these bows for the kids because they were crying, and I'm going, what are the bows? So they had to talk about, these are these hair bows. And um, so I'm listening to this story, I'm like, mm, you know, like zoning in because there's something going on here. And so I was out, I had Lord on tour in LA, so I went and uh, called the manager of Jojo Siwa in Pasadena, ran up and had lunch with her. And uh, Jojo was this person from Dance Moms, this, wacky oh. show and uh, she had 6.4 million YouTube followers and she had a deal with Nickelodeon but everybody's cut cable there isn't necessarily a show to hang it John there's no like Nielsen ratings all the sort of benchmarks you would have used to determine that this was going to be successful were not there like there were there were no the metrics on reading it and so she sells a lot of stuff she yaks on the phone, she has these videos that Nickelodeon's made. So I said, I just had lunch with her and I said, I'm in, uh, yeah, I got it. And she said, everybody says we're gonna lose money. I said, I'm gonna put all the money in, don't worry, I got it. So I started small, I kind of got medium and we put, a th we put a run of theaters up. We had about 20 theaters and the thing blows right out in minutes, it's gone. So I pivot then to the summer, I put another run of 25 dates up. I'm now in the five, 6,000 range, gone, out the door. And I'm like, put some arenas I've now opened up. I'm in sort of arenas at the end. And I'm looking at UK and putting that up. And um, she's now 9.5 million YouTube followers. But the, what's so interesting about this is that it's, it's the trying to read it, you know? Like you have to have some kind of gut instinct to it that, yeah. you know, and things that have gone before and just um, worked in enough kid stuff to know that I, th I think it'll go, you know? And um, 
it's always got to have kind of a frenzy sticky factor to it, you know, like kids have to have to be and do. And, and then I go talk to lots of kids, you know, and I find the best places that the hair, the hair when you go get your haircut, it's, they all have kids. And it's like, what are you doing? What are the kids? Where are they going? What are they wearing for Halloween? I mean, you know, I'm, I'm going to work on another Disney show. I'm going to try and work on, you know, Disney with a lot of uh, filming with their new streaming service and stuff because I know this stuff and... I don't know why. It's just something that's natural. Maybe it's that uh, while everybody else is out chasing the um, hottest, sexiest thing, I'm like, I can make money with this. I'm gonna, I'm gonna do this. So, anyway. What What is your take on uh, American Idol 2019? No. <laughs> so if they offer you nothing, it doesn't matter. It's over. It's It's a TV show now. Um, um, TV to live isn't a thing anymore. It's I don't care what your show is. So that's played. They out. had the voice. I thought I could change the voice. I was going to talk about magical thinking. How you know, that would be a perfect example of it. How you think you're a super person and you can change things. And um, our competitor had had done the voice, and I said, oh, they screwed it up. They couldn't have screwed it up that bad. And sure enough, you know, we put it out. Took a million dollar sponsor, which helped underwrite the cost, but did 1,400 people, you know? They came, it just, you know, you can't, you can't, uh, you're not superhuman. Sometimes leave it alone. If, it, if you, when you're feeling like that, walk away. Let someone else go plots. So the TV to live broken at this point? It, it doesn't exist anymore. Okay. What, what's your prognosis for Woodstock 50? Well, I did 99 and 94. I was at 99. Wow. Okay. Um, I don't know. I, I don't get it. No, it's, a lot of people are saying that. I've known Michael Lang for a very long time, you know. He ran the craziest event in 94, and it was the most fun ever. But 99 was not fun. It was... Um, yeah, it was messy. It was, it was just you had too many, um, you know heavy rock bands and stuff it just it 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 was just hot it didn't rain it just it was it was a very isolated location hard to get to expensive bottles of water expensive bottles of water who knew someone said that we've reached a saturation point with festivals in the united states mm -hmm. and that they're losing their you'd cachet agree? yeah you, you'd agree with that well we have coachella and uh Firefly and Jazz Fest in New Orleans and Hangout in Alabama and I'm I can't I'm sure there's others I can't think of at this moment but there have been some that we've put on hiatus and like we just either we didn't have the right plan or the right location or the right time and um, or they'll just eventually just fade away into into nothing but um, you know. <laughs> It's always been the same when it was boy bands. What, what, was there three good ones? And then you had a hundred. And every time you see something that works, everybody's got to have one. So. Now you're involved in international? Uh, in touring. In touring. That's mostly what I work on now. So who are some of the artists that you would get involved with on an international basis? What, I guess Elton? Um, so uh, I'm working um, with Jay in our LA office on uh, Elton John's three-year farewell tour, and that's a huge project. But it's absolutely wonderful. We we did this uh, enormous press conference um, in New York to announce it, right. and uh, we had virtual reality. We made a whole film. I mean, it cost a lot of money. I mean, it was just the most amazing announcement. But what was important about it is we spent the money, but everybody in the world knew. I mean, it went round the world. So it was, it's really helping us because this is a worldwide farewell tour that's lasting three years. So that's great. But I carry on to wood touring. You know, our company, you know, Louis Messina out of Texas has uh, Taylor Swift and Ed Sheeran and... Um, um, Sean Mendez and then George Strait, Kenny Chesney, and, uh, Eric Church, a lot of other country. I'm forgetting some things. You know, we have Rolling Stones, which we're now postponing. Um, Celine Dion, um, Justin Bieber, I've carry on to Wood. You guys get involved with hip hop? Um, have, yes, some. Um, 
not everything is a tour, you know, like um, touring, you know, uh, a lot of hip hop is, is uh, more American, you know, there's not that many dates you can go play in Australia and other places, so the answer is yes, but not to any great extent. And then with your experience with the uh, Argentina uh, tango stuff, so where are you or where is the company with Broadway now? Nowhere. AG has never been a company that had anything to do with Broadway, ever. There seems to be a resurgence in, you know, in, that, in, the, in the jukebox musicals and now... Uh, Just like I said, every time there's like two or three of mm -hmm. something, you know when you saw Mamma Mia and you said, okay, I'll take one, please, nobody do this again. Now it's all. I mean, it's Cher, it's The Temptations, it's Jersey well, Boys. Springsteen on Broadway. Well, Springsteen was different. He yep. actually, he actually um, created his own show and talked about his life in his show. And I guess he actually did it. It's, you know, not like Cher's, Cher. not, Cher's not on Broadway being Cher, you know. With Springsteen, back to the promoter, um, Okay, but it, so Brinks, Springsteen's on Broadway, so right. all of a sudden you have everybody going, well, I'll just go on Broadway. And you go, you don't understand. You're not just going to go play your songs on Broadway. Bruce created a show. You know, he acted in it. He, he, um, you know, he took his book and he told his story. It's very different than yeah. the performance. Yeah. But his management, uh, didn't they change some of the methodology or the relationship with the concert promoters when, they, when he goes out on tour, which is different than some of the other acts? I think um, they kind of were acted as their own promoter with the local promoter sort of plugging in on a fee I, basis. I think you're mostly thinking of New York where uh, both John Cher and Ron Delsner in the past... Uh, Cher. Jeez. upset them, John Cher and Ron Delzer, so they basically said, you're both out, you know, and so they do it themselves. I think New York is that one place. So that's the one place? Yes. Because th th that, that could really upset the, the balance of relationships if these large acts didn't need a promoter per se and did it themselves and then paid a fee to the local guy to, here, you just do the marketing and, and sales and we'll take care of everything else. Um, they've never, there's certain artists uh, who don't self-invest in themselves. They like a large guarantee. And um, so they'll always have a promoter so they have somebody put up the money. And what's, what would be, without divulging any corporate secrets, what, what's usually the, the revenue share between an artist and a, and a promoter on, on those big arena dates? I mean, what's the percentages usually? It's still pretty much a 90-10. 90% to the artist, 10% so, after cost. And, to, and after cost, so the promoter has to do all the marketing and advertising. And then what happens to the concessions, the parking, and the merch? Is that thrown in as part of the 10%? Mm, merch belongs to the artist, and uh, the, the, the parking that belongs to the venue. But doesn't some of the merch go to the venue or the promoter? It goes to the venue. It's a, it's a rev share deal with the venue. And so in the case where the venue is owned The promoter by, never has anything to do with merch. I mean... Unless the promoter owns the venue. All right. No, I mean, I'm just, I'm, I mean, I'm just saying, I okay. mean, you know, Live Nation owns all these venues. Oh, so if you're in a smaller level, that would make sense. I was thinking arena. I mean, I was cutting an arena deal in my head. So if you're, if you're clubs and yes. That would go back into that venue. But, uh, you know, we have Bowery Presents, which is uh, right, a company with us, right? So they would have lots of clubs and things, and they would have um, merch deals, and they would go back into the bottom line of running and operating that venue, which they're in, you know, is attached to Bowery. So. Yeah, it's because I know people always go, wow, $50 for a T-shirt, but they don't realize that that's not the artist necessarily controlling the price. It's... There's a lot of hands in that mix there. Okay, maybe we'll take some of your questions here. Um, <laughs> okay, so Leonardo, talking about Woodstock, said that uh, you are listed on a website as the talent executive for Woodstock 99, 
and in attempting to emulate the original Woodstock Festival, what, what did you find was one of the most difficult challenges that you had to deal with? So I was, I was new. I had just moved to New York. So um, um, I, I ran the talent from the, what that meant was, the talent was, um, all of the artists were kept in a compound up the hill. And I ran the talent to the main stage. It meant you had to bring them down in a vehicle and drop them off with me, and then I babysat them, and then I put them on the stage. So I was, I was maintaining the talent to the stage in a rotating manner and looking after them. And, um, and um, I had this one incident where all of a sudden Nine Inch Nails came down, and they're in the mud, because everything was mud. I mean, we were, we were swimming in it. And I thought, oh my God, somebody's attacked my band. How, what am I going to do? Nine Inch Nails are in the mud. But this was a look they wanted to get on stage. So they go dragging all this muddy sea creature look and to go play their set. And um, um, what was the question? What did I learn from it? What did I? The responsibilities. Oh, the responsibilities were surviving getting through it, you know, um, just getting the artists on stage. It never stopped raining. I mean, it was just mud. I mean, when I had to go home, they had to get a tow truck to take my car out of the mud so I could get it out so I could go home at the end of Woodstock. But um, you were, you, when you were on the stage and you were looking out, there was a hill at the back and it had become like a mudslide. And everybody was just up there sliding down the mudslide back into what was in front of you. And all we did was just keep putting bands on stage. <laughs> <laughs> just rotating through. You know what I think made it work? It was 25 years. Of, is that right? No, 99 was 25 years, right? No, that was. How many years ago? 30. So what are we? What are we now? We're 50 year. Yeah. Yeah. 25 years ago, I was right the first time. Yeah. G Gina wanted to ask you: Has anyone ever doubted you in the music industry because of gender bias? Um, you get excluded on stuff, you know, like guys need to get together, you know, to talk about the same thing you could have told them. You just, it still happens. I mean, it really does. It's, uh, it's better, and it mostly happens with older people, you know. It happens less, although you have this bro thing that goes on. And, you know, sometimes I'll have an artist and she has like the three or four bro managers and I'm like, you should wear name tags because I'm, I'm unable to identify you in all wearing the same clothing, saying the same thing, being the same person. I mean, it's true. And all they want to do is make money and they want to get in and they want to get out and uh, somebody's going to buy them. And I just find that offensive. So, you know, but I find it easier to bat them about than the old people that I still have to deal with in the business. Right. Um, so, yes, it still exists. Uh, Caitlin asks, what was the biggest lesson you learned in your career so far that helped shape you into the woman that you are today and want to know if you had any advice to give a female about to, entertain, to, enter, to enter the entertainment business? Two parts there. Well, I'll tell you that um, I think I, I think I was probably about 38, and that was the year I went, I got it. Like, I mean, there was like this light went on. I thought, I got it. Like, I finally, I got it. I can do it now. You know, I, I don't know what it was, but it takes a really long time to, you know, have the confidence to go, no, pass, moving on, not going to indulge in magical thinking. Um, you know, understanding your deal sheets and, um, and, and being really self-assured about it. I mean, I, I was a different person after that. I just like, I got it. So I think in all the things that you're going to do, you're going to have to put your time in. And I was trying to think, you know, when, when we're working on doing shows, we have a production department that's involved in production are the people that we go down to and we have to tell them, does it, this fit into this building? Does it fit on the stage? I mean, can I get these six trucks in? Does, um, do I need the sound and lights? Do I need to rig it? So we have, we have this whole department that gets a say in, in what we're doing. And then we go to ticketing and we need to 
Um, th they work very closely with us because we've, we've made ticketing estimates, we've you know, created manifests for what we're going to do on a tour on every date, and we're like, are these, are, these, uh, are these realistic, are these the right prices, have I mapped them out properly? And marketing plays a role in, in how we're going to sell it, what we're going to do, how we're, how we're going to make this thing work. And, um, you know, and then to an extent we have accounting and we have legal. And I mean, everybody plays a role in buying a tour and putting it together. And I'm very much about pulling everybody in because you're all going with me. You know, if we're in this together, we're going we're to get this done. And so when you talk about getting into this business, there's so many ways or things to do in this business. There isn't just what I do. I mean, I, I buy and it's really scrappy and um, you know, somebody yesterday said, I didn't know a little body like that could yell like that yesterday. And I said, well, you know, <laughs> sometimes. Um, but there's so many other, other ways that you can work in this business and be creative or, or we have tour accountants. I mean, I was talking to somebody the other day and, and she's really mathematically inclined. And I said, we need people who are mathematically inclined. We really do. We need you to love music because you're going to hang with music people all the time. But we need, you know, people who like math. We, we, um, we need people who are technical, who like production. We send people on the road. We have people, we have tour crews that are going out all the time. We can't find enough people in our office to work on our productions. And, and we train them, and um, a lot of times we, we lose people you know, to event companies in New York, because you know how much money they pay. Like, and then they work for Google and Facebook and YouTube and all these people. So that's it, marketing. We have people who come and work their way up through marketing and then the next thing they're moving to another city to run a marketing division in another city. So it's not just us, I mean it's our competitor. We're always looking for really good people. And one of the things I think you have to have is you have to be able to multitask. I mean if you can't do three things in your head at the same time, like you know, while you're sort of spinning, that's that's kind of what working in showbiz is that we do, you know? And, um, and you gotta kinda keep them straight. I don't care if you write notes on your arm, like you, you gotta get them all done, you know? Um, so getting into this business, interning, you know? Does uh, <coughs> AEG have interns? Yeah. You know, I kind of have a rule, and it's like, it's, when somebody says no, you make sure they mean no, not yet, right? Like not yet. Like if I send it in next week, like is that better? Or if I call you on Tuesday of the following week, will that work? Or, you know, I really think I should do that job. I know you're saying no, but you mean not yet, right? Because you'd like me to do what? And then you'll give me that job. I you would know? say the word no, that's when your job starts. Yeah, but don't take no from anybody. Just take it as not yet. Okay, and make sure they understand that you know it's just a not yet, right? I'll be back, because people love that. I used to have this kid going back to Ottawa, like way back at the beginning, and he used to sneak into every show, and he was always backstage, and he always like worm some pa pass from someone. But I was so fascinated by his having to be there, you know, like <laughs> I just thought that was so amazing, and he was like this 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 you know concert rat. And anyway, he went on to run one of the biggest merchandising companies in the UK, you know, because he loved it and nobody was going to say no to him. I'm sorry, he was going to be there because he was going to be part of this industry, you know, but he just wasn't going away. I have the, I have Great the greatest story. production manager in the whole world and um, he, he came as, as an intern trainee. And in 2003, when I started the new office and I could barely afford people, I had eight people, he came and he used to sit there and I'd say, what are you here for? And he goes, I'm still learning, I'm still hanging. Well, this kid hung in to being like head of production. He's running like the main stage at Coachella. He does this every year for us, okay? And because he hang around and wouldn't go away, you mean not yet, right? Okay, hang out, you know? That's what happens. Those are, those are the people, you know? You have to get there and then don't go away. And you have to be really great and, and learn your stuff. 
and put your time in and come in early and go home late and get people coffee and just do really nutty things like, you know, like I'm here for you, you know? It's true. Yeah. Uh, Christopher wanted to know if would you share the most hectic tour that you had to work on and see through at the end, to the end. Oh. Oh. I don't know. You know, I can never think of anything. Like, I'll leave here and I'll drive home and I go, oh, that was the one, I should have mentioned that. But um, I can't think of one. They're, I, all, they're all kind of unique. They're all, you know. They all have their quirks yeah, and nuances. Yeah, they do. Um, you were named, uh, I think, several times in Billboard in various capacities, but um, uh, Anna, I want to know what, what it was like for you when you were first named as one of Billboard's most influential women in the music business. It was, it was pretty exciting the first time. I think they only started this about 2011. I think Fergie was the honoree that year, and it was a, it was a small um, kind of dinner at the Peninsula Hotel in the ballroom. And now it's grown into, you know, a much larger event. It's quite different. I mean, it's a TV show now, and now you're kind of a woman in music prop for, you know, <laughs> the making of a TV show. It's not the same. It really was fun the first time. It, it, there was a whole bunch of women who had never had the opportunity to kind of get in the same room at, at one time and do that. So it really was pretty special. And it's kind of changed into something different now. You know, it's quite wonderful. They have a lot of entertainment talent now and they make a TV show and right. we the women clap for them so uh, Jacqueline asks what are some of the differences between booking American based acts versus internationally based acts for tours in the states uh, no different at all it's it you know um, years ago I think it was probably quite different I mean believe it or not in the very very this is pre my time like in the very uh, early, early days, the uh, promoters used to go to a room at uh, JFK Airport and the agents would fly in and they'd spend like a weekend meeting and doing all their contracts and the agents would go back and the promoters would go home and that's how they did their business and did their tours. But um, today it, it doesn't make any difference. It's the same agent, it's just gets, it gets put in the touring cycle, you know, when it is. Um, you know, tour teams handle it. It's, it's pretty easy. Sarah, want to know, uh, in your opinion, what venue do you feel is the best? Um, it would depend, you know, um, what you were doing. I think the Coliseum in Las Vegas is an awesome room. Um, I like Madison Square Garden. It's a great arena. I mean, it just is, isn't it? There's just nothing quite like it. Um, we have a new Webster Hall opening. Maybe it'll be great. I haven't seen it yet. Very soon. Um, okay, here's one. Teresa wants to know, what does a day in your life look like? And what are some of the key aspects of the job that you participate in? And uh, what are some of the tasks that you have to do once in a while to ensure everything is running smoothly at AEG New York? Okay, so uh, I have to run in the morning because if I don't run, there's no living with me. So I get up. I'm avid, probably, avid runner. Yeah, I'm probably up at 5.30, 6 o'clock, maybe 6.30. And, uh, and then New York Times out the door running. And uh, then I get to work. I'm always late. It's about 10.30 when I get there. And then I work to probably about 8 or 8.30 at night. And then I go home. Or I go to a show. Or if I have a dinner. And then I'm usually, uh, then I do it again. But it's, it's usually, I usually, I'm not home till at least 9 o'clock or 9.30 every night of the week. And don't call me on the weekend. But it's, it's really just managing things. And um, you never know what is going to happen. Like, can, you can imagine, you know, Concerts West are division out in LA, and suddenly you're taking down the Rolling Stones stadium tour, OK? So you, you're just minding your business that day. You go to work, and you get that call. And from that call, you know, all these things need to happen. Um, you know, um, we're going to be announcing a really big tour tomorrow, and um, 
um, is going to be done in the LA office. It's not, it's not me. And um, I know that months and months of planning have gone into this. And you'll see from this campaign that's going to come out uh, tomorrow and this announcement that's getting made, you'll be able to see all of the detail that went into it and how this thing will last for the next three or four days. And, um, and you'll be seeing this you know, socially. I don't think you can kind of get away from it. So you know, somebody worked on this for months to put this together uh, to make this um, you know, be really splashy when it comes out tomorrow, that kind of thing. So what's your day? My day is um, you know, Joe Siwa, Carrie Underwood, Elton John, uh, John Mellencamp on tour, um, and the projects I'm working on and getting offers out, um, just some of the things that I'm trying to put together for the fall and for the spring. And um, it just never stops. It just keeps going and going. Like, you know, if, um, if there's a lull, just start back through it again because there's things that need to be done always. You can, you're never finished. You just put your pencil down at night, you go home, you come back the next day, you <coughs> just keep working at it. So. And pretty much everyone in our office is like this. I mean, whether you're in ticketing, production, marketing, accounting, it's, it's just this, this grind. It just goes on all the time. You know, we have happy hour at the work. You know, we, you know, it's, it's a pleasant place to work. Nobody. Um, How many people? How many employees? We're about a hundred people. I mean, uh, I'm mostly uh, AEG and touring on one side, and then Bowery Presents runs a large uh, part of the office. And, um, but it's all hours. Nobody, nobody bothers you when you come in or when you go. You, if you can't meet your responsibility and do it, you, you you need to do, then you're in trouble. Now, other than that, nobody really cares, you know. I so. think that's kind of the work ethic in the entertainment industry uh -huh. now. It's because you can do a lot of work in the car or at home. Well, everybody has lives. They have kids. They, they have things they need to do. Nobody cares. If your job is done, that's it. get it done. Yeah. Going along with the earlier part of your statement, uh, Jade says the Rolling Stones just had to postpone their tour due to Nick needing some heart work. How do you guys go about remedying that with so many different things being involved, and does it still end up being as cost effective as your original projections, or I assume you do have to adjust things? Well, so the key word here in the announcement they made was postponed. Postponed is a very good word. Postponed means there'll be a new date and it's looking to be rescheduled, which means hang on to your ticket. If they had said Rolling Stones canceled, that's a whole other matter. That's a, that's a complete taking everything apart, you know, adding up losses and everything you've spent. Um, um, there's a lot of insurance goes into touring. Um, you know, be it um, ensuring advertising, lost profit, uh, cancellation of dates. I'm not saying I don't know the detail on Rolling Stones, what there was or not, but I'm just saying that in a lot of cases that um, if it's a very expensive tour and, you know, sometimes you'll just insure parts of it just in case, you know. But th this, would, um, this would have a good reason. You can't um, just not feel like touring and have, you know, insurance be valid. It has to, has to have a, a valid reason, so. Uh, let's see. Oh. But stadium, stadium tours aren't easy to put together. I mean, they have to they have to fall within a certain range and driving range, and stages have to get moved, and you know. You recommended in one of your articles some books to read. Oh, that was I don't know. That's why. old. I think that I think That's that dated? was Howard University was yes. uh, was asking me. But do you want me to do some of the things I had? I had just a couple of notes on things that I thought were important. If you were, if you yeah, were, that would be that would be fantastic. That. You share that. Okay. Okay. So I I kind of call, call this like from fear to fearless. And if you're going to come and do this, you have to go from fear to fearless. You just have to. Um, it, it, it pivots me to the. I remember at the beginning. I mean, I was so wound up, I was so tense, I was so into this, I was going to be the best that I actually developed our alopecia areata where my hair fell out in patches and I went to, the, uh, you know, like seven specialists and they said, you need to relax. And I went, okay. So after I relaxed, you know, I sort of developed this, what do I have to lose? Like I was just going to do the best I could do and that's all I could do. And no matter who I had to call, who was really scary, I would go, what do I have to lose? I'll get on the phone, you know, and most things always turned out okay doing that. Um, if you're going to go into the business where you're looking for talent 
and you're trying to manage something or you're going to be a buyer or you're going to buy something, you have to kind of develop a, um, a sort of sixth sense to what's going on out there and what somebody might say. Like, he might mention some band he saw last night, best thing he ever saw. Go look them up and see if they're any good and if they have a manager. Um, you know, it's... Um, when I got High School Musical and I, I called the agent and said, I've got to do this, let's, let's put this on the road, I had a friend of mine tell me that his son was so obsessed with the DVD that I guess they had it played in a car. He had to pull the car over to the side of the road because this kid needed to show him something. And I said, ding, 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 I'm in, you know? So it's, it's the story of the bows. Oh my God, the kids were crying. I had to go get the bows. And I'm going, okay, I'm hearing you. You know, I um, had, um, I worked on a, another show and the kids, kids at Halloween had costumes from that show and I went, you got costumes from that show? And so I had to go do that. So, I, you know, nobody ever mentions a band to me or a name to me that I don't uh, use my phone and I send it to myself and the next day I go and check out whatever it is you sent it to me. I take every clue, everything, you have to, because, you know, when somebody calls you and wants you to look at American Idol and you go, ah, I don't know, I'll look at the tapes, you know, that changed my life. It really did. If I hadn't had the millions and millions of dollars I made on American it's really, a, it, I opened the office, I had money, I ran revenue, I ran positive, and I was able to, you know, get things going. So you take the call, you talk to people, sometimes it's a complete waste of time. I have no problem going, it's, you know, it's not for me. It's for someone else, you know, not for me at this time. So um, I think too many times everybody evaluates the upside. Everything's going to sell tickets. Uh, all the shows are going to sell out. Everything's going to be great. Evaluate your downside. You always need to ask yourself, what happens if I'm wrong? Okay? Um, you know, our business is really only one simple equation how many people are coming and what will they pay? Everything you do if you're working in live entertainment is based on that. How many people are coming and what will they pay? And if you can answer that question, you know, honestly, and then apply your expenses to it, you'll be fine. But evaluate your downside. Nobody's coming. You know, I remember stupidly years ago I had a party with a friend of mine and we thought yeah we'll do this party we're like really popular everybody will come we'll do it on New Year's Eve it'll be spectacular and I think we spent about twenty thousand dollars and then nobody bought any of the tickets to the spec party and we're planning it and I'm going oh my god somebody save us and then everybody came and I never did that again now I you know evaluate your downside okay so um, that was one of my first lessons on that um, <laughs> I think that if you're going to go into this business, you need to understand all the aspects of producing a show. It's not just knowing one aspect. If you can work in multiple divisions with people, you know, intern yourself in many places to know how things work and all the pieces fit together, it's really invaluable. I mean, you know, probably I know more than anyone because I started at such an early time and you know pre-cell phone you'd get to the venue you set up the box office you put the people in to sell it I would run back downstage you'd get the piano tuner you let him in the back door you got to run back upstairs because the guy was coming delivering something and you'd get the catering and you spent this whole time zooming around knowing what everyone did and paying people and the bills and everything now you have it so it's kind of you know, a little more segmented, but if you understand all the pieces that work, you know, if you have a band and you're on the road, you know, you'll understand what catering you can get and how you're going to make it work and how the costs are going to be effective and, and touring and vans and rentals. And if you write production, they'll show you how to get around and it's, you're not going to waste your money. Um, um, the other thing that we guard against is being aware, be, um, Beware of the song. It's a song, not an artist. So sometimes when you fall in love and you're like, oh, I'm in love, they're just the best. It's a song. It's not an artist. It has no legs. It won't go. So you have to learn what's a song, what's an artist, okay? I I'm in touring. I don't tour songs. I tour artists. So I often fall in love with things and I have to go, I think it's a song. You know, take a moment. Don't get in too deep. Like, you say it's fantastic, but, you know, you're probably not buying. 
Um, we talked about magical thinking, don't do it. Um, guard against flattery. If you work in this business and you have to deal with agents, oh my God, they will work you over. It doesn't matter what they say to you. If the answer's no, the answer's no and get off the phone, okay? Spill your coffee on yourself, I gotta go. Just go, no, I'll call you later. Um, I think the thing that has probably worked uh, the best for me is that um, I grew up largely in a, in a male world and uh, men don't know how to deal with a smile and you go, great, good, and um, right? And uh, sense of humor and a smile and just do it. And nobody knows what to do. Men don't know what to do. So I've been doing this for years and then I just move on. And like I said, nobody knows what to do. So here I am. Um, There's a secret. Um, Let me ask you, who yeah. would you consider uh, some of your mentors? Uh, Donald Kay, who was my mentor. I, I just had one. Just one? Just one, yeah. yeah. I can't, what, what he shared with me was, was invaluable. You know, he let me be a promoter. Um, so he could go golfing. Because he always said, let a woman run your com company because she won't steal it. That was, that was his theory that he worked on. I, wasn't, I wouldn't steal his company because I was a woman. Isn't that wow. funny? That's but Tom, that was okay because he wanted to go golfing and then I got to run it, which I just wanted to run it. I don't think I, I, don't think I thought I needed to own it at that time. You know, I saw a lot of the, heart, uh, the headaches from owning it, you know, the paying everybody. And, and promoters at that time... Um, you know, you could have five great ones and then one disaster and you have to build yourself back up again. So it was a lot of pressure. So I don't think I wanted to own them. Huh. Um, <clears throat> uh, Samantha had mentioned that the Concert Promotion Division of AG has a mantra of the, that you guys look for talented new artists ready to tour. And she was wondering what things make an artist ready to tour, aside from not being a song. Um... What would you look for to, you know, what were the clues that you'd say, yeah, this could work? Well, um, it helps if the uh, act has a record label. I think less and less, but it still helps because it means it's, it, there's somebody else is committed to it too. So they've made a financial commitment too. And it means that somebody's going to um, put the money behind the songs and make videos and kind of keep things moving or, you know, make sure it's on Spotify, whatever. And, and a fan base. I mean, you have to have some fans. You can't just show up on our doorstep with nobody. Like, we're, we're a little bit past that. Like, you could get a club buyer, maybe, but I still think you have to have some fans. I think you've got you've to figure out, you know, how to get some of the smallest bookings you can think of or get people interested online or get your friends to click through or do something. But, um, so you know? that begs the question is how do you get fans if you're starting out? I don't know. Because <laughs> um, you, you can't get into a club unless you promise a certain amount of people are going to come in. And you can't get an agent or a tour if you don't have a big enough spread of fans, I guess one of the things would be Facebook. So it seems almost like a catch-22. Somehow you have to figure out what that magic key is to break that. I think you just find the smallest club. I mean, there are some clubs that are only like 150 seats or 200 seats, and you make your friends come. I mean, I'm sure that's been done since the beginning of time, right? I would think and so. um, and you start there, and then you post the pictures, and you you know start writing comments. Somebody must make them up to start. I mean, you know, um, and then you hope that some people see it and something gets sticky about it. And uh, I see I see some artists and uh, management does everything right. They release things in the right way. I mean, now it's, you, you know, you kind of keep a continuous stream of music to keep things moving along. And they make great videos. And, um, and uh, they have a record company deal. And, you know, I'm thinking of, of an act. And I, I can sell at Radio City Music Hall and, and big cities. 
and I can't get into the country. Like somehow there's no penetration there, which means that it's either just well-to-do people in cities who have some ability to see it in some way and live with it. But if you move out into smaller cities, they're still maybe on cable, they're on, um, on traditional radio, and they, they're not quite you know, that caught up in it. So there's some of that still happens. There there's, isn't this uniformity thing. I mean, you know, with um, hip hop's a little bit different now, but it used to be you had 15 markets. I mean, that, that was what you played, right? Um, some acts to start should only play 20 places. I mean, that's all you should do, like, and, and work them, and, and then you're going to have to move out from there. But I'll tell you, I always remember Metallica and um, being in, uh, in Quebec, being in Montreal, and uh, managers of Metallica calling Donald and going, um, what other cities do you have in, in the province of Quebec, and we go, other than Quebec and Montreal? And he goes, I don't know, like Chicoutimi and Rimouski and Lac Saint-Jean and, and, and uh, Cliff and Peter, who are the managers, said, yep, yeah, we're gonna go play them. And Metallica got in a van and they played every town, every place you could probably think of in Canada and the United States, and they went to Europe and they played, and that's why they are who they are today. And not enough people realize it's the playing and performing that gives you the longevity. I can tell you how many acts never bothered going to Europe, and they can't go to Europe today. They don't mean anything there. Like Brian Adams, huge superstar in Europe. He used to go play Europe. Uh, bon Jovi, huge in Europe. Um, Lionel Richie can play arenas in Europe, not, maybe not here, you know? And um, so live is the one thing that fans always remember forever and ever, and they'll go back and see somebody again. And that's where you make your money. So figuring out how you're gonna get to live is really important. So from your book of secrets, one of the questions someone asked uh, Christian was, what are some of the do's and don'ts artists and bands should follow while on tour? Just be great, you know? Like, just get on stage and be great. That's all you got to do. And, and love your fans. Like, love them for a really long time, even, you know. I, I can think of artists who are, like, completely crabby and don't want to go out. And they walk in the room and they turn on. Like, like have your turn on face, you know? Get out there and meet people. You have to do it. You have to love your fans. Then you have somebody like, um, like a Celine Dion. She loves her fans. She would stand on stage and talk to them all night if, if they would let her. I mean, there are people you can feel when your band loves the people that come to see them. And, um, you know, I have John Mellencamp who's a client, and he's, he's different, you know? <laughs> he's a little more standoffish. So. <coughs> yes, he um, is. Right? Yes. She'd stop smoking. See so, ya. Yeah. May I ask a question? Yeah, of course. Um, you brought up the term offer earlier. And one of the things you do during the day is you send out offers. Mm -hmm. Can you explain what that means within an offer? And when you're thinking about maybe competitors putting in an offer, what you're trying to do that might be different? Is it all just money? Is it more than that? Can you kind of get into that? Um, mostly, if you're talking about things at the club level, um, agents usually know where they want to play. They start out because everybody's kind of at them. So they start out with a, with a um, mind space about I'm playing that room, that room, that room, and that room. And you can call them no matter how many times you want. They're playing that room whether it's yours or not. So, so at that level, that's what you're kind of dealing with. Um, sometimes you'll get them on a second pass if you didn't get them on a first pass. Um, but even the, even the club level has become... Um, um, club tours. So there's people that work in the club divisions who, who work on club tours and looking now agents are looking for bonuses on their club tour and stuff. That's how competitive it's become. And I remember, you know, like a long, long, long time ago, we used to have clubs and we used to use it as a lost leader. We used to put on our balance sheet and how much money we had to use on clubs. And now the paradigm is so shifted that with the internet and everybody has 500 to 1,000 fans, which we didn't have before because there was no way to ever have anybody look at anything or reach out to them. So clubs have become um, profitable and um, 
and there's lots of them and lots of club dates. So, um, how many seats in a club? It, it can depend from, you can have little tiny ones at 125 to probably 500 to Webster will probably be about 1200, 1300 to Irving is 700 to Bowery Ballroom is 500 to all of them would fit into the category of clubs. And it would depend if, um, if your artist had come out and played all the 150, 200, got that done, you would then move them up to 500 to 700 or maybe a thousand. Like you would take the, the two step if, and this would happen quickly. This wouldn't be like you might play 150, 200 if you sold it out in April. And let's say by August, you're playing 500. Like nobody's letting the grass grow here. You just keep going, you know, on something like that. Um, you, you don't pause. You keep building fans because you can't live on 200 fans. You've got to keep adding them, you know, to what you're doing and go find some new cities and do that. So, um, offers if you have the preferred room and somebody wants it if that's the centerpiece room in the city you offer them what you would typically offer them and they're probably fine with it the little bit of back and forth but if there's two competing rooms and you're putting an offer in for it they'll they'll play it off until one person wins you know so sometimes they'll the agent will just cut to it and say i'm playing this room so they just don't like the auction they don't like the ticket price going above what they want it to be so they'll kind of cut it off and stop it you know, if they if they think their artist is worth um, twenty dollars a ticket, and that's the first play, and you're down the street and you're offering twenty five, you know, I got twenty, I can do it, and they don't want that. They don't want that ticket price for their artist. They'll they'll stick with with the person with the right offer for twenty dollars. So, because what you're doing is you're you're kind of perverting it too soon. Like kids will go, ooh, that's a band. What do they think they're twenty five dollars for? You know, like you don't let these things happen if you're trying to build and make something successful. Um, you were involved with uh, Ariana Grande? Yes, I did her first tour. So can you share with us what that was like? Because, I mean, now she's this megastar. It was fantastic. It's my, it's my, if I have to say my deepest regret, that's my deepest regret. And, um, you know, I had, uh, I had it. It was mine. I, I, you know, yeah, I blinked, you know. I blinked. And it's always about uh, you have to you have to just see into the future, and you have to go. I always knew I always knew who she was going to be. I always knew, this. and the deal just got really stupid, and I blinked, and I lost it, and I've tried to get it back, and I've 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 escalated. I've done everything possible, and I haven't been able to. Um, but you were there in the very beginning. Absolutely. Absolutely, from the first song. That wasn't a song. That was an artist with Mac Miller. And that you, song. And, and you knew it. I knew it right then. That was it. Yep. You know, I did Fifth Harmony. I did uh, her their tour, and I really believed that um, they needed. They just needed the songs. They just didn't have enough body of work and they had to work it. And I did this whole thing and it was really good. Like we sold it out, we did really great. And we were just starting to kind of figure out um, they had this very multi culty audience that was a little bit different. So probably needed to be marketed to a, a little bit different, which was different than, you know, typically pop acts or white suburban girls tend to be your number one and then fill in other things with it. But this was very different. And, um, and then they decided they were going to do this really large tour that was too big for them. At not, I didn't do this. They took the money, and, um, and that was kind of the end of that, you know. That, um, so, you know, sometimes you, you could see a thing happening, you can't stop it, and that's, you know, you can't. So that's, so. One, of, that's one of the frustrations. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but Justin Bieber was somebody that um, I've done every show he's ever done. And uh, his first show was on an arena stage in Hartford Civic Center. And, um, oh, I worked hard to get that. Oh, I mean, I really did. I put a lot of money up on somebody who had never played a show. I just knew. And um, he had just done his, uh, his um, um, the mall situation in NASA where they had to, you know, shut the mall down and get him out of there and <laughs> that whole thing. And, um, and then we had, we had put together smaller tours, and I said, this is a crime. Like, you cannot, 
um, announce this and sell tickets for a place that's too small to live with the bedlam. I mean, like, we're going to have to go to arenas. So it was like half an arena. Now it's a whole arena. And we did. And, and he, he did it. He, um, he, he got it done. But it was, um, it was really interesting that Scooter Braun, who's really smart, and um, he, um, he, the, he put him with, with this whole urban band and everything. Like, he really did all the things to cool up this 14-year-old, soon-to-be 15-year-old kid from Canada, you know. And um, it was great. It really was. He, he was uh, a trooper. He's, you know, I've done this three tours. And, um, and uh, there you go. Um, what women are... Not role models, but who who do you look up to? Or who do you respect or admire in the in the business today? Um, Cara Lewis, she drives me crazy, but I love her. I mean, I think you know. we should tell people who Cara Lewis is. Um, okay, so if you go back to the eighties, and if you went to William Morris Agency in New York, you would go down a hallway and you would see all kinds of um, people hanging out in a hallway, and you had you had beepers, you had a pager, and uh, they were waiting to see the crazy redhead, which was Kara Lewis, and she was the only person in America that would handle hip hop. Okay, nobody did hip hop but Kara Lewis, the crazy redhead. That's the truth at William Morris in New York. And um, they would bring in cash, like she she ran like a, a cash thing, and she they were it was so wild, it was the wild west, and and you had um, you know regular promoting offices going, oh I don't know, you know, because it was so crazy, none of it ran, you know, in any kind of system, and she 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 built this up to the extent. It's, it's only recently. I would say that um, no hip-hop act wanted to work without Kara telling them what to do. I mean, seriously, she built careers. She built stars. Um, she held it together. She never lost it. She looked after her clients, and it was so wacky. And I have nothing but respect for her. I mean, she's... She's usually screaming and yelling, but that's okay. As long as it's not me, I'm good, you know? And, um, yeah. I would say she's one. They're, um, you know, Carol Kinzel. There's only a few female pioneers. There's Carol yep. Kinzel, who's an agent out at uh, CAA, and she has, um, um, today, she uh, has Lana Del Rey, uh, Radiohead, um, The Cure. Um, oh, I can't think. She has, like, she has just, like, uh, Dua Lipa. And, uh, you know, <laughs> she's, she's, she, we always talk about Carol as having the best ears. She she just has great ears. So if she was picking something, you knew she was on to something. So you would you would want to have whatever Carol uh, 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 Carol was selling you. Anyone else outside of the, maybe outside of music? Um, outside of music, I I read. Uh, the audio book changed my life because I never had enough time to read. So. I'm the only person with an iPod full of books. And when I go running, I listen to books. And I never not read. It's, it's what always makes me late. Everywhere I'm going, I can't, it's like I'm addicted. I mean, I'm a history buff and um, lots of literature. And um, I would say, I don't know, I was writing women that I admired and um, Billie Jean King you know, for the perseverance to beat Bobby Riggs to show women the way. Um, when you think of the woman who was tackled and thrown out of the Boston Marathon because women weren't allowed to run marathons, okay? There's a woman in Africa named Wangari Matai who I love a lot, who, um, who um, realized that um, the devastation to the environment was, was harming women and children. And so she started the Greenbelt Movement, which has planted 51 million trees in Kenya by paying women and children pennies to plant. I also work with Pencils of Promise, which is um, a charity that uh, uh, um, has schools in uh, Ghana, Guatemala, and Laos. 
And we've just uh, uh, built our 500th school with 90,000 kids whose education is provided for them, uh, though the community builds the school and donates the school. And um, this was actually Scooter Braun's brother, Adam Braun, who uh, went around the world um, in high school on a boat and um, almost died when the ship almost collapsed, uh, uh, capsized at some point, and um, promised he would go back and help all the kids that he met. I'm shortening the story a lot. And um, started, you know, Scooter helped him. We had this first charity thing. We were all squished in with Justin Bieber and Usher and LeBron James, and we're all at <laughs> this charity, you know, giving money to get this thing started. And uh, here we are today with uh, 90,000 kids going to school in those three countries. And uh, yeah. it's got to be an interesting dynamic for you having gone to a, a small little schoolhouse and now going to another country and helping them. Well, I was, gonna, I was going to, um, I'm, and traveling is my other thing. I mean, I work so I make money to go places. I mean, I w just got back in December. I went to, um, uh, to South Africa to Johannesburg and they went to Botswana and then I went to Kenya last year and you know obviously did a safari yeah, um, yeah but South Africa was different that was not on safari but uh, yeah I have friends who's um, uh, um, an African photographer so I go with him and um, my partner passed away two years ago, and he was a great photographer. So it was 15 years. I would I would read books and explain to him the context of what we were looking at when we went traveling, and he loved hearing the stories. And then he would take these great pictures. And so now we just have stories. <laughs> so um, you know, and I should mention that my daughter, who was seven when she came to New York, is um, 32 this month. And she went and studied theater at USC. And when she graduated theater at USC, she, uh, uh, I, I made her go to French school in New York. She went to the Lycée Francais, poor kid. So, <coughs> so because of that, she, uh, went, she went back to Montreal to work on the show with Dominic Champagne, who directed um, Love in Las Vegas, the Beatles Love uh, show. And she did this show called Party Perdue, which was one of the most amazing things I've ever seen. And it was it was uh, theater and film, mm -hmm. and so three sides of the theater was film, and there was nothing on stage except this powdery substance and actors. And yet you watched them row in a river and pick flowers and bury bodies and do all this stuff that never existed. I mean, it was acting and film. It was it was just amazing. Oh. So she stayed in Montreal after that, and then she transitioned into. Um, staying with the film people, and now she works on um, live shows for artists who are touring, like Katy Perry and Taylor Swift and Justin Timberlake and Jay-Z, and she just did Kevin Hart's arena tour to the stadium when he needed it blown up, and so now she's actually producing, directing, and doing shows. So the trajectory from being, you know, 23, 24, having worked for a couple of companies, and they kept they kept thinking she was just going to be the girl. You just, you just be the production girl. You just run the production. You know, we're not moving ahead. So um, she's now doing that. She's, she has her own company and um, working really hard. And uh, she's working on three different shows right now. Congratulations. So, you, know, you did good. Yeah. Not her wife uh, worked for a company, and she decided she's going independent, and she's opened her own management company. So now you have two freelancers, you know, and they have a baby, and living in Montreal, and um, she went home. So, wow. yeah. So, you know, you just don't know. You know, you stay at it, learn the craft, you know, go do it, believe in yourself. That's the most important thing. And no means not yet. Right? And go from fear to fearless, all right? So in the limited time we have left, is there any questions, any you have that you wanted to raise that we hadn't touched yet? Everybody knows everything, huh? <laughs> all right, um, I wanted to ask you, um, uh, we all know what NARIS is. Recording Academy Society, and they do the Grammys amongst other things. But so Neil Portnow made a statement. Step up. Was, yeah, I thought it was kind of dumb. I don't know what the right word is, but so he says, step up. So as a successful female executive in the business, 
What are your thoughts on that subject? Well, it was so interesting that I did uh, Lord's last tour, who I love, and um, she was, she had, she was the only woman to be nominated album of the year, right? right. And she was not even offered a slot to perform her song, whatever the song was, from that album. Mm -hmm. And so she in turn, remember she put the poem on the back of her dress and sat in her seat, and the poem was, um, it, it talks about how tragic this is, but we will have courage, we will persevere, something like that with the, the palm on the back. So I'm living through this, and I'm so offended that this has gone on, and then you have Neil go, well, women just need to step up. Like, like what? Mm -hmm. You know, like you were the gatekeeper. You said you can't perform. How should she step up? You know, it's like, why don't you get out of the way and it will step up, okay? So he took a lot of heat for that, all right? And he deserved to take heat, and now he's going to go away, and they're going to get a new president of Naris, and I think they come in for the Grammys uh, for 2020. There'll be a new president. So. And, I, and I would assume it's going to be a, a woman replacing Neil. Yeah, but in some ways, thank God he said it. Like, it's just such a great, stupid thing to say. Yeah, that absolutely. You, what? Right? It's, it's, the, it's, the, it's the silence that's harder to sort of fight and beat back against, the, the never saying anything, you know? It's, you can call someone out for going, whoa, you know, that's not good. We're not going to do that. So the not saying anything is harder. Oh, uh, Friday night, was it at the Rock Hall of Fame, Janet Jackson, she made her statement, too about having more women included in the Hall of Fame, how few are there, mm -hmm. and what a big deal it was for Stevie Nicks to be the only woman who was put twice. In twice. Yeah. Although Harry Styles was her. <laughs> was kind of. <laughs> anyway, made great TV, I'm sure. Um, any last minute questions? No? Okay, well then, I'm going to thank I'm going to thank Deborah for slipping out here tonight for us. Well, thank you. You know, you know, the truth is, part of the reason I'm here is women just aren't busting through, and I'm not quite sure what that is. I mean, I think it's too easy to just be complacent and just you know, get your, your spot and then stay there. And don't do that. Just keep moving. And I think part of that is, is not getting comfortable and, and, you know, being friends with everybody. who there, there are lots of people who go to jobs and they just like the job, okay? They have other things in their life and that. But don't stay there, you know? I had to move on and I see people at the office and they're going off to have lunch. I don't get invited to lunch, okay? I get to be management, I haven't been invited to lunch. It doesn't happen, and I'm okay with that because this is what I picked, this is what I wanted to do. You know, so um, keep moving, don't, don't, you know, be John Baden who sat at the front of our office the end I go, you're still here, and is the greatest production manager in the world, and thank God he stuck it out and we, kept, we found a place for him, you know, so. There's, and there's lots of areas. We need good ticketing people. We need good accountants, whether you're on the road or in the office. Um, marketing people, digital marketing people, marketing people. Like there's two kinds. There's, you know, people who run tours and you're running in accounts and then people who are digitally moving everything, in, you know, inside that account. Um, you know, buyers. You gotta be scrappy though, so. And you gotta love music. You gotta love music. Don't, don't, you know, I guess you can come and do all this, but it's the people who love music. It's that kid I told you about that would sneak into all my shows who ended up running the merch company, one of the biggest ones out of the UK. I love those people. If I had to hire somebody, I'd hire a, a club rat. I'd hire the, the kid that booked the worst club. I, I did, I hired this, this one person who's gone on to be a major executive at Live Nation. I unfortunately lost him. I mean, it, it happens sometimes, but it's okay. And um, he came for a job interview and he booked a small club in uh, New York. 
And while I'm busy asking him questions, he's busy going, you know, when you have a Ticketmaster deal, do you? And he's asking me all these questions. And he said, you know, if I never see you again and I'm not coming back, I just need to know this. So if you'll tell me this, this would really help me with my job. And I was so impressed by that. I thought, he's interviewing me while I'm interviewing him because I'm going to be of some use. My information is going to be of some use to him, what he's going to go back and do if he's stuck booking his club back there. So, you know, it's, I read the New York Times. I wouldn't be here today probably if I didn't live in Ottawa and go to university and read the New York Times, you know? And it's just those, uh, be interesting. You, you have to, you know, if you're not going to golf, uh, and you're not going to talk sports, uh, you know, you have to have other things, politics, literature, anything. Just get in people's faces and start talking, right? You know, sometimes they don't know what to do with you. Then you grin and you laugh, right? And there you go. So I, I, do I, it. Okay? I want to know the book you're going to recommend. <laughs> I don't know. You got some? I got about sick guy. You want me to what's, look what's at the well, no, What's in what? your iPod? What audio book? Okay, I'm going to Australia. Australia. I just can't believe it. How do you have history for 150 years, right? So I'm busy reading a book about the first convict ships that went to Australia. That's what I'm reading. So they would clean up Margate Prison. They would think they'd send a thousand people. Oh my God, uh, uh, you know, England's free. And they, the prison would fill up the next week and they're going, now what are we gonna do with these thousand people? Send them to Australia. You know? <laughs> and uh, yeah. But it's a motley crew that went to Australia. So I'm trying to build on a foundation because Elton is um, starting in Australia. He starts in Perth on November 30, and we go to the end of February, finishing in New Zealand. So I have to go to Australia, and I figured I'm going to learn about it. Learn about it. And I'm going to go somewhere, and I'm going to. There has to be some context for me for me to really inter. You know, I just can't look at something without knowing what I'm looking at. So, all right. That's what I'm reading. Okay. Boring. No. Okay. Interesting. Okay. Good. See you guys next week. <laughs>